All right, Matt, welcome to the Gar- Jehu Garcia podcast. you uh i have only interesting guests in my podcast and uh, you're so <laughs> graciously accepted our invitation to be in the podcast well thank you for inviting me appreciate it yeah so why don't we talk a little bit about what you do you work for the south coast air quality management district i do so i am the chief technologist there uh and that's kind of a it's a interesting way of saying i'm the main technology guy at the nation's largest air district so the South Coast AQMD, we are the regional air quality agency, government agency, that's in charge of bringing our region uh, into compliance with the federal clean air standards. And we make up um, the four county region of LA, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino. So you know, like 17 and a half million residents in our area. Uh, just, a, a, you know, you would think of it as the greater Los Angeles area. And then my job is really... Uh, trying to bring and develop the cleanest possible technologies to help with their air quality problem. Yes. So you're so you're saying this to meet the federal guidelines. So the, so the the federal government has a set of standards, and then oh, we're yeah. supposed to. Oh, yeah, oh that's so the, interesting. Yeah. So well, you're you're a Southern California resident, right? So you know our air quality historically has been horrible, right? L.A. Yeah. smog is infamous across the world. Yeah. Um, and so the feds, the federal government, the EPA, has a set of standards for the whole nation, which are based on health standards. So in order to have clean, healthy air for everyone that breathes, uh, they have established limits for different pollutants. The big one is ozone or smog. Um, and we in our region are in non, what's called non-attainment. So we, we're not meeting the federal standards for clean air. Uh, wow. And historically haven't been. So we're actually classified as an extreme non-attainment area. Um, wow. And what we've been trying to do is bring the cleanest technologies to bear for the region to help help with that problem. And it's mostly the mobile sources. It's yeah, it's so. Wow, that's crazy. We're the rebels in the country. But I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, it's it's warranted because, like you said, there's 21 million people here. Right. Uh, or something like that like just in the Los Angeles area. Yeah, I mean, our our whole region, the South Coast Basin, there's actually, I think it's 17 and a half million residents Same. in that four county region, right? It, yeah. Uh, if we were if we were our own state, right? Like if <laughs> if the South Coast decided to secede from the nation, uh, we I think we'd be the lar- the sixth largest state in the in the union. In population. We're, we're in population, right? Yes. Well, so we're a huge population dense area. Yes. Uh, and we also have the two ports, the, the port of LA and Long Beach. So yes, that's the sixth largest cargo gateway in the world, right? The two largest ports in the nation. And then 40% of all containerized goods that come in, in the United States come through those two ports. So, you know, TVs from China and sneakers and whatnot uh, that come over from uh, the Pacific that go to, you know, Chicago, Long Georgia, Beach. wherever they come through our port. Wow. Yes. That's great. Yeah, that's a thing that people don't understand. It's like, and then California traditionally has been the, you know, the the uh, culture of, of the car, right? Car culture is huge oh, yeah. here, because we have so we're ex- like the land <laughs> expanses, you know. And so we all own a car. I own four cars, you know what I mean? Like it's a it's a weird thing. And so that is that where most of the uh, the 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 poor air quality comes from is from transportation. Yeah, absolutely. So mobile sources is the key component to our, um, our smog problem. Um, and even though, like you're mentioning, you know, we've got millions of light duty vehicles. I think there's, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 million light duty vehicles on the road. Um, most of the smog problem comes from on-road heavy duty trucks. So, yes, semi trucks. You know, before the pandemic, when you were driving on the 60 freeway or the 710, yeah. You know, it's wall-to-wall trucks, and it's those heavy-duty vehicles that emit the most NOx emissions. And yes. NOx is a precursor to smog, and that's what you, you know, when you take your car and it gets smogged, the tailpipe test, they're measuring for NOx. So oh. NOx emissions create smog, and that's what we're trying to reduce. And it's mostly from on-road heavy-duty trucks is the main culprit. Yes, and as I understand, like, uh, 
like small passenger cars have there's been heavy restrictions uh for air quality right like the the whatever the, the apparatuses that go into the the the, the motors and right. the exhaust systems the catalytic converters all stuff now that's those go back far like many years right i mean decades now right absolutely yeah so it turns out that actually the light duty vehicles, so passenger vehicles, are actually passenger pretty vehicles. clean nowadays, right? Yeah. You've got these these new except cars. Except for Volkswagen ones. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. yes. Except for those that were again, yeah, yes. were cheating the whole uh, federal standards and the California standards. But uh, yeah, except for those, you know, but they were caught. Um, most light duty vehicles are super clean. They got the three way catalyst, just like you mentioned. Uh, and you're seeing hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and battery electric, and even fuel cell vehicles now, which are zero tailpipe emissions. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, that whole, the car culture and the car sector is getting super cleaned for um, criteria pollutants. And criteria pollutants are those that create smog, right? So smog is not an issue with the light duty sector, but yeah. they have a huge CO2 footprint. So ah, the okay. passenger vehicles have a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Greenhouse and so gases, yeah. that's where you need to, we need to really clamp down on uh, the emissions from the light duty sector. Ah, at the, but for the South Coast, what we're worried about is smog and bringing, as I mentioned, our region into compliance with the federal clean air standards. Yeah. Um, so we're not as focused on climate change, but it, it sure is nice if you can get both, right? You can get yeah. Well, yeah, they're, they're tight together, right? Better climate. Yep. Why, why did, because as I understand the, the same regulation for heavy commercial vehicles did, did not exist for a long time, the same as in the passenger vehicles, right? Right. Why, why yeah, is that? Why, I mean, if they're, if they're the biggest polluters, why <laughs> is it that it's up until recently, a few years ago, right? Like that they became the standards well, they're actually implemented. Yeah, they're actually different standards and it's because it's, um, they're different technologies, right? So the light duty vehicles, it's a gasoline, um, you know, if you want to get geeky, it's an auto cycle. Uh, heavy duty is typically diesel, which is a compression ignition. It's a diesel cycle. And so they are different technologies. And also the displacement is much greater for heavy duty vehicles. And so it makes sense that they probably have a different standard. It's based on the, the energy output. Um, but the, the state, and the federal government uh, have is, have established standards for, you know, s tailpipe emissions for heavy duty vehicles, uh, and they're actually based on a petition from the South Coast. Uh, we asked the EPA to have tighter standards for those heavy duty vehicles, and they're going through that process now. So that's they're actually undertaking that procedure for tighter regulations. Currently, hopefully, with this new administration, they'll uh, take it up sooner than later. Yeah. Yeah, because that was a huge thing, right? I mean, I know I have a brother that, that works in trucking business. He has a trucking business. And he was he was telling me, you know, what the new standards were going to mean. You know, it's like, all oh, my old trucks don't work. They, does it make sense to, to, to put these expensive, you know, scrubbers or whatever filters you got to put on the on the tailpipes and stuff? And so they were, he was having a, there's a program where you would turn in old trucks and I think they right. would like help you buy new ones. Yep. that had all this equipment installed and so he was going Absolutely. through all that yeah and i yeah, was blown really, away at that time by the way i'm like it. i'm like what what do you mean you guys ne don't have like these catalytic converters and he's <laughs> like no i'm like how is that possible i'm like this i thought this this went back you know like many years for for a uh, passenger vehicles obviously did right so i thought it was the same with the commercials but yeah, for for big, I mean, your was it your brother-in-law? Your brother had that my brother, truck? yeah, my brother, yeah. yeah, your brother. So I mean, those trucks will last what thirty years? These diesel technologies are just, you yeah. know, workhorses, super efficient. The only problem is they put out a lot of pollution, and so we do have uh, what we call incentive programs to get truckers into cleaner technologies, because these new technologies are typically more expensive. Yeah, uh, and so there are a lot of different incentive programs, you know, and we we actually just opened one up for uh, heavy duty trucks. Uh, so you know, if your listeners are interested, uh, or if your brother's interested, <laughs> go to our yeah. website www.acmd.gov. Uh, look under, um, uh, I think it's under business uh, incentives, and there's you know there's a program that's currently open that helps them get into cleaner technologies. Wow. Yeah. I think, yeah, he's in San Diego, so we don't care about him because he's in another True. region. So, <laughs> but uh, no, no. Yeah. He had to redo his entire fleet 
you know? And he was telling me how it's challenging because they are more expensive and it, it doesn't make sense. Right. And I remember at that time I was like, well, how is it possible to like, because I, I'm into DIY electric conversion cars, right? Like right. I converted my car and stuff. And so then I thought, could we do a semi truck? Is it, I mean, it's just a bigger car, you know? And we were thinking about it and he's asking me how much battery do you need, you know, and the thing. Oh, wow. And we were seriously thinking about it. I thought like, yeah, we could do it with like $100,000 worth of batteries, you know, because he has a set route so we can put chargers in oh, each wow. side of the thing. We're there like, it's just, yeah. it never happened. Cause I was like, well, you know, <laughs> it doesn't have, hasn't <laughs> well, happened yet. Uh, well, you know, the good news is, I'm glad I'm glad you're thinking about that, but the good news is um, you've got major uh, manufacturers now that are looking at battery electric trucks. In fact, we've got two uh, demonstration projects with the two of the largest truck manufacturers in the world. So it's Daimler Trucks right. North America and then Volvo Trucks North America. They're both working on class eight heavy duty battery electric trucks. And those are the big trucks that pull containers out of the ports. Yeah. And of course, you probably heard that Elon, you know, Musk, and yeah. we've got a Tesla truck running around somewhere in stealth mode. We have yet to see one actually on the road, but that's supposedly yeah. in the work. So you're getting a lot of these big players now coming in and saying, hey, we're going to electrify the trucking sector, which is really exciting. Yeah. And there are, uh, like in the port themselves, the little trucks that tow all those stuff, that's electric. That's been electrified for a long time, right? Yeah, that's right. So those uh, those small yard hostlers, we call them, or yard trucks. Um, uh, there are some that are uh, uh, lead acid. In fact, they have acid. ones that are they're automated. They're like robo, oh, wow. <laughs> robo yeah. yard hostlers that are completely automated. Um, but we'd like to see those go to the newer technology. So that way you don't yeah. have to have these huge warehouses full of lead acid batteries. And, you know, of course, lead, has, there's a concern with recycling of those batteries. Um, uh, but also fuel cell could be a uh, could be another potential um, yeah technology because refueling's faster. I mean, so there's certain advantages and disadvantages. But yeah, you're right. There's 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 plenty of different technology or duty cycles that could fit those technologies, for sure. Yes. Okay. So now let me ask you about some little history because here's the thing that I've heard. As you said, for, it's known that the state of California, especially Los Angeles in particular, it's, it's got such bad, terrible uh, smog, right? And I remember reading something and talking to, like, some coworkers back in the day. This is, like, in the 90s or whatever, where they were like, you know, th this is nothing. Like, you, you just you guys were not around in the 70s, but in the 70s. <laughs> It was really bad. And so they like show pictures or whatever. And then I'm like, what? Really? Like it was worse than this? Because it's pretty bad, you know? And they're like, no, this is actually much better. This is a, a, a evidence that the, the, all the rules and the regulations that have been put in place are actually working. We just don't notice it because we don't remember. We have short-term memory, right? Like uh, <laughs> loss of root. Yeah, well, yeah. you're a really young guy, so yeah, you probably <laughs> weren't ex weren't around when uh, we experienced uh, stage two and stage three smog alerts. So back in the, it was probably late '50s, '60s, and '70s. So I grew up in the '70s here back. in Southern California. Wow. And even in the '70s, there were uh, smog alerts where uh, you couldn't see the San Gabriel Mountains. You know. Uh, Downtown LA in the 50s and 60s, you couldn't barely see across the street. The smog was so bad. Wow. Um, and you, I don't know if you've ever experienced, probably not, but where it, the smog was so bad, it would make your eyes tear up. Um, you would feel this heaviness or burning in your chest. Um, and, and that was just due to this, this smog or ozone, which is an oxidant. And so that's why it made your eyes water and your lungs hurt. Wow. Um, and so you don't, we don't have that anymore. In fact, there's many days when you can actually see the San Gabriel Mountains, right? Yes. Uh, uh, so it has gotten, you know, appreciably better. In fact, if you look on our website, there's data that shows that it's, you know, almost an order of magnitude better than that used to be. But the reality is, even if you're better than, you know, if you're, if you're better than when it was back in the 60s, which was horrible, you're still pretty bad, even though it's good. It's better, right? So yeah, uh, we're still not meeting the federal standards. We're still not meeting the the air quality uh, yeah. that provides healthy, you know, air for everyone and uh, living in our region. So we still have a lot of work to do. But you're right; it's a lot better. Yeah, but I mean, that's I mean, that's a task, right? To to keep it to 
to make it better when the increase of vehicles in the road, to increase of business, you know, yeah. and commercial business. I mean, it's it's growing every year, right? More and more. And so the fact that it, it has been getting better, that's that's something to be proud of, I think. Um, Absolutely. Right. In fact, that's that's something that we we take great pride in our region is that you're absolutely right. The economy is not suffering from having cleaner air. And it's because, you know, for a variety of reasons, but mostly because you've got cleaner technologies coming to, to bear. Um, uh, and a lot of the regulations that the state has put on passenger vehicles and heavy duty vehicles, they're taking effect, right? So unfortunately for your brother, he's got to change over his fleet, but it's yeah. with cleaner technology. And so even though they're driving more miles and even though they're, there's more vehicles, uh, it's actually much, much cleaner. And so the air quality is getting better. Um, that, that the problem that we face is we, we actually need to meet the federal standard. There's, there's a couple standards that have to be met, one in 2023 and one in 2031. So 2023 is just around the corner. Yeah. In 2031, it's not that far away in terms of, you know, vehicle design lifetimes. And so we still have a lot of vehicles to turn over or replace with cleaner technologies in that time frame. So it's still, it's still a daunting challenge for sure. So what are the, the main programs that are happening right now to, to, in order to meet those goals? Because obviously, and what are the goals? Like how much, like what is, what is the 2023 one? Like do we have how many points or how many particles yeah. per million i don't know how do you measure how <laughs> yeah, uh, good question yeah how we're doing yeah. or where we're at yeah it's it's really as i would mentioned it's based on nox emissions so nitric oxides that's a precursor to smog or ozone and by our estimates we've got to reduce nox emissions by 45 percent in the base oh that's so a lot it's almost 50 percent right 50%, so that's like yeah half it's, of the it's a huge yeah. amount so if you can think about everything that emits NOx emissions, that's every possible combustion source. So on-road heavy duty trucks, construction equipment, as you mentioned, these little yard trucks, all these cranes at the ports. Um, generators. Generators, locomotives, lawnmowers. marine vessels. <laughs> even lawnmowers, lawnmowers are, yeah. They're really dirty because they have that oil that's a two-stroke <laughs> engine, right. right? It's like- They're two strokes. <sighs> yeah, absolutely. Mm. So we, and we also have an electric lawnmower program at the, the South oh, Coast that folks can take care of. Leaf blowers. And if you, and those leaf are blowers terrible. They, just, they should ban those because they're so <laughs> noisy. Yeah, no, that's, another, that's another subject. But yeah, those are like, it doesn't seem like they would pollute as much, but those are unregulated, right? Like those are just spewing, like they don't have catalytic converters in there, right? They don't have no... Well, there, so there's, there's a there's a couple four strokes instead of two strokes for leaf blowers that are much much cleaner and okay. much quieter. Uh, but there's also electric versions that we are incentivizing on our website. So again, if you go to our website, uh, okay. you look up lawn and garden and leaf blowers and lawnmowers, and there's a, a program to incentivize the changeover. You you bring in your old gasoline powered leaf blower or lawnmower, we scrap it, and we'll give you a big discount on a new electric lawnmower or leaf blower. Wow. Forklifts. But those are the, yeah. So, but but you're you're saying you know forty five percent reduction in NOx. Yeah. That's a huge amount. And so we've if you put that in terms of just let's think about on road heavy duty trucks. That's the biggest sector as I've mentioned. We've got to re replace about I think it's two hundred thousand trucks. Ooh, yeah. Uh, okay. And there's like four hundred thousand or so in the state. I mean, so it's a huge number of vehicles. So let's yeah. let's even let's let's think even in a, a smaller universe, there's 15,000 trucks at the ports that go into and out of the port of LA and Long Beach. So okay. we'd love to start there, but 15,000 in a short amount of time, right? So you can imagine that's just, that's the kind of stuff that we're really trying to uh, attack first because that's the low hanging fruit, if you will, right? And there's, um, I know we've been talking a lot about battery electric and zero emissions, but there's also near zero or what we're, we're calling 90% cleaner technology that's available and that's running off natural gas. And so we natural think there's some um, commercial technologies that are available today that you could bring to bear to help us with our air quality problem. Yeah, anything that to help, right? Because 40% if you want to meet that. What happens if you don't meet that? It's, uh, is that, I mean, it's just the, the federal government just looking down on us going like, once again, you Californians <laughs> can't. Can't can get your stuff together. 
Exactly. No, that, you know, the, that's a great question. And the, I guess the nightmare scenario is the federal government comes in and says, California, you don't know what you're doing. And so we're going to take over and we're going to mandate oh. what you do to get to clean air. And so there's talk about, you know, no drive days, shutting down businesses. Uh, I mean, yeah. so there, it could be very draconian. Uh, and there was a, you know, there was actually a big concern with the Trump administration that they might actually do something very uh, drastic like that to California. Wow. Um, with the new Biden administration, we don't think it'll be that drastic, but still the federal government, you know, could come in and say, you need to do X, Y, and Z because you're not meeting your obligation for clean air. So that's, that's the big concern. And that, that would be a huge economic hit to the region, right? The yeah. federal government telling us how we, ta we would operate as a region. Yes to meet the federal standards. And and the concern is real, right? Because this is not just, oh, the skies look gray and ugly or whatever, but this is like healthcare. It takes a huge toll in the healthcare system because people are sick all the time. Um, and so yep. it's, it's money that is being invested in just now fixing people instead of fixing the trucks, you know, and, and then. Yeah. So, I mean, it's Great money that's going to have to be spent, right? So it's like, you might as well spend it cleaning up the air instead of, you know, bad, you know fixing the yeah, damage that it gets done. Yeah. Great observation. I mean, yeah, the, the, uh, uh, there's economic studies that have, we've done and that others have done that shows that the, you know, what we call negative externalities, right? The, co the health costs, the missed days, the asthma cases, hospitalizations, all of that, you know, the, it totals in the billions of dollars, which and it far exceeds the cost to come into compliance. And so uh, we think it is definitely worth the investment in health to clean up the, clean up the transportation sector. Yeah, there you go. So do you only deal with the emissions that are coming out of combustion engines or also some others? Because I was uh, having reading this one story where there's a lot of asthma cases in the inland, not inland empire, the Imperial Valley. I don't know, somewhere like over here where the, the salt and seas at and mm -hmm. the reason is because all that coachella. wind the coachella valley right and it's all that wind right. picks up all that dust or whatever and it's all agricultural runoff and stuff and right so there's a huge there's a crisis over there too and no one seems to know what's going to happen with that uh so yeah the the salt and sea and the coachella eastern coachella valley is within our district oh, so okay. we you know we run all the way from northern la county uh, all the way out into the the assault and sea so that's part of our district and you're absolutely right the um, the issues there are much different than you would see in urban areas uh, the salt and sea there's a lot of uh, particulate matter mostly pm10 so the very large 10 microns uh, particulate uh, with these dust storms and whatnot and pm2.5 so they're a little bit smaller particles um, as well as Occasionally, you get that really bad sulfur smell that coming from the Salton Sea as you get turnover of the, the mass, you know, the decaying mass and in, inside the Salton Sea. Um, but a lot, as you're mentioning, it's a lot of dust from agricultural uh, activities. You know, the Coachella Valley has a big ag, um, is a big agricultural center. Uh, and it's, yeah, it is a much different environment. And so the way that we've been handling it, the way the state is handling these different communities and air quality problems is under a program which um, was authorized under a legislative bill called AB 617. Uh, and it's really the way the state is characterizing now as a, a community air protection program where the state and the local air districts select um, typically disadvantaged communities and then apply a lot of different uh, tools to those communities to help clean it up. Uh, and the Eastern Coachella Valley community is one of the communities under that AB 617 or community air protection program. So we're right now going through the process of identifying what are the major air quality problems. You know, we have a community steering team that gets together and helps us identify what are those issues. And then what are some of the things that could be brought to the community to help with those air quality problems? Yeah, yeah, because I, I, you know, it is the thing that is different, right? But it's also the same thing as having the same effect as uh, right. health problems and stuff. It's just a slightly different source. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but we're kind of close to that, you know? It's just east of us here, and we're like, it's it's pretty to go see. You're like amazed by this giant body of water, you know, that it's, it seems like it doesn't belong there. And then you're like, 
<laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, you're like, it's kind of unhealthy because <laughs> of all the stuff. I once was there and I was, uh, I remember I grabbed some of the sand or whatever and then I started itching. And I was like, oh my God, like this is, this is bad. Like, what is this? Like, it's really, I guess there's a lot of chemicals <laughs> yeah. down there. Like, um, and yeah, that's one of the things that you have to deal with. Um, so how about what's the biggest technology you think that is going to make the biggest impact? Is it going to be electric? vehicles like battery operated electric vehicles or i mean there's hybrids right i remember driving hybrid cars for a while and those things were amazing they would go they were very efficient i remember i used to have a honda that used to do like 50 miles per gallon which right. at that time was like that's pretty amazing right. you know and yeah and so if you're yeah, not I, burning that much fuel that means you're not putting that much you know stuff into the atmosphere or yeah, I think um, th there's been so much effort now by the light duty car companies, right, to develop um, electric drivetrains, as you mentioned, right, the hybrids really took off with the Prius. the Prius. And then you had the plug in hybrids with GM Volt and the Nissan Leaf was the first electric vehicle. And that really started this whole kind of transition and evolution into really high mile per gallon vehicles and um, uh, plug-in hybrid, which as you mentioned, get over hundred miles per gallon, right? So just that, so that whole electrified drivetrain is really unlocking uh, the key to this new technology of true zero tailpipe emissions for battery electrics, right? So I think all the major manufacturers are now looking at battery electric as at least an offering in their, in their lineup. Uh, which is really exciting. I noticed your VW bus, right? So even VW's got a, uh, what do they call it, the Buddy uh, van that's coming out here in yeah. the next couple of years, right? So, uh -huh. yeah, I mean, they're so. all looking at different uh, segments of the market where electrification could take place, which is great for air quality uh, from our perspective. Uh, but if you look at the medium and heavy duty space, um, battery electric makes sense in certain duty cycles, right? So short range, because um, as you you know you're talking about charging, where do you charge? Uh, do you have sufficient power to charge the vehicles? And operationally, you know, when do you charge? Creates a load on the grid. So um, we think battery electric makes a lot of sense in certain cases. Certainly, you know, medium duty delivery, you know, package delivery, heavy duty short runs to the port and uh, you know close close warehousing. Uh, but if you start talking about interstate over the grapevine you know longer haul we think uh near zero natural gas makes a lot of sense and fuel cells if you want to go to pure zero emissions so fuel cells uh, are you familiar with fuel cells it's they're essentially electric vehicles but yeah it converts the hydrogen to electricity on board so you gotta yeah. fuel with hydrogen yeah those are zero tailpipe uh and fuel cells have been around for you know for since the Apollo days, you know, Apollo yeah. missions. They're on the um, space but, station. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it is a, it's, it's a, it's a proven technology, but if you can, you know, the key is really, can you do it economically and yeah. can the car manufacturers, truck manufacturers do it in a way that they can make a profit, right? They make, can make a, a business case. And that's what, that's really where the struggle is, is because these are typically very expensive technologies. And so trying to mass produce it at scale, to bring the cost down is where the challenge is. Yeah. So is one of them right now, any of those technologies making a huge impact? Would you, or, or is it, I mean, cause I know like fuel cell technology is still kind of like off into the future. I know that Toyota has a program, but it's kind of vaporware. Right. It's not real. I, I know there's some cars <laughs> that are running there. There's a couple of fueling stations, at least for passenger cars. I, maybe there's programs where and larger vehicles. I know, yeah, they don't. They have like a program where like they have like city buses or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. something like that where like they they run. Uh... So what? Yeah, we need to get you into a fuel cell passenger vehicle because it actually is real. Is it okay? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, my. You know, there's actually quite a few people at my place of work that drive fuel cell vehicles. Really? There's fueling okay. Stations. We have a fueling station in the back of our building in Diamond Bar. Uh, really? There's about sixty fueling stations throughout the state 
uh, both Honda and Toyota and, well, I'm sorry, Honda, Toyota, and Hyundai all have commercial fuel cell vehicles that are available for lease. That's why they uh, have they're, electric cars. They're just, they're yeah. wonderful cars. If you ever, yeah. if you've driven one. Uh, yeah, because they're essentially electric fabulous. cars. It's just, you're getting your energy, not from a chemical battery, you're getting it from, well, it's, it's a, it's, it is a chemical battery, so it's a gas. Yeah, yeah, it's a different chemistry. Exactly. But uh, yeah, no, it's essentially right. an electric car, right? And I mean, we drive an electric car. I drive my, and my wife drives a Tesla. So yeah, we totally oh, right. love electric cars. Um, yep. It's just it's, the fueling. So if you've, I don't fuel. know, if, um, for folks that have ever fueled with uh, compressed natural gas, uh, and you know, there, there's not a lot of those, or there hadn't been a lot of those out there. Honda had uh, compressed natural gas vehicles, but the fueling is very similar. You just, you hook up the nozzle, you turn a lever and it, you start fueling. So, and it takes, you know, five minutes. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit longer than you would fuel with gasoline okay. uh, because it's a compressed gas, but um, it's very similar to the way you fill up a gasoline car. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but then it's zero tailpipe, you get, you know, significant range, 300 miles on a tank. And so it's, uh, it, it, it is a, a very exciting technology. Um, but yeah. you know, your original question is, you know, what do we see as making the biggest impact? It's got to be batteries. Battery technology Battery is technology. advancing so quickly. I, mean, I knew I was um, investing in the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> there's tons of uh, battery electric vehicles that are, you know, for sale now. Uh, you can, yeah. you know, get anywhere from a Tesla to you know very small uh, sedans. And so there's there's lots of different offerings that are available. There's even a uh, plug-in hybrid uh, minivan, right? So there's, um, yeah, there's, the, there's uh, different segments. Yeah, what's it called? The uh, Yeah, we, we, we were playing with some of the batteries because for some reason they had a program where a lot of batteries became available. Um, and we use them in some of our conversions because these batteries are pretty right. cool to LG you cam go. cells, yeah. Right. Um, wow, yeah, so that's, that's it. Yeah, the Pacifica. Chrysler Pacific, Pacific right? yeah. Is that the there one you're you talking about? Yeah, yep, there you go. It. So, so are you? So your your department's the one that makes the standards, cafe standards. Is that what it, what they're called? The 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 ones that are, uh, per, uh, manufacturers yeah, have gallon. to. So yeah, manufacturers no, right. have to make a certain amount of zero emission vehicles, right, to right. be able to sell that's in California. The, yep, that's the state that sets that up. So that, actually, that's a. Uh, it's a good differentiation, I should point out. So the state, the California Air Resources Board, California is, the, Resources. is the state regulatory body that's in charge of setting the standards for mobile sources uh, throughout California. And then there's the federal government, the EPA, that sets the standards for the nation, right? Uh, and so the, our, our state regulations are more stringent than the federal regulations, and that's because we have a waiver... Uh, when the Clean Air Act was uh, promulgated at the federal level, California already had its own regulations. And so because of that, the Fed said, you can go ahead and make your regulations. Um, we'll give you this waiver uh, uh -huh. that allows you to set tighter standards. And that's always been the case a few times where they haven't granted the waiver because of different administrations. But uh, we do have stricter standards. And part of those stricter standards, as you're mentioning, is this the zero emission vehicle regulation, which requires a certain percentage of the car sold in California by a certain date have to be zero emissions. Yeah. Uh, and, and then they're also promulgating now this cleaner heavy duty vehicle regulation, the advanced clean truck regulation, um, where by a certain date, a percentage of trucks sold in California have to be zero emissions. Ah, so you okay. You can see that, you know, they're steadily marching toward yeah trying to get to zero well, emissions for every possible vehicle in california and i think that's very very important because I, like from my perspective i think none of these uh car manufacturers actually want to make clean vehicles they're they're just like hey gas works why change it if it works why right. fix it right and and of course you know you're like their job is to make vehicles right their job is not really to look after the air quality right <laughs> there's departments for that but but so then that means that H1 those regulations have been forcing <laughs> i mean twisting their hands you know into building or developing these new cleaner technologies i mean that's the feeling that i get i don't have an insight 
right? I don't I don't know for a fact that that's what's happening. I know there's probably there's a bunch of things are true, right? The, these uh, the car manufacturers there's a giant group of people, so maybe some people do believe in and the mission, and some people don't. They just want to make cars the way they've been doing them. Uh, probably both of those are true, but it it seems like because of those regulations, it, you know, Tesla exists and now GM has made cars that are compelling, um, and every other manufacturer. Yeah. I know, I know that. Well, I I think you know Toyota and Honda. I guess because they're going the 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 other way, they're not going the battery uh, technology right route. Um, right. But they're making I, cars that are. If, you know, zero emissions too. So yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. That's a great observation. Is is, and I think the California Air Resources Board, the state, would fully take credit for saying, if they did not have the ZEV, the zero emission vehicle regulation, or what we used to be called a mandate, mandate, uh, the car manufacturers wouldn't have made those vehicles. Yeah, and wouldn't have advanced the technology to develop hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and now electric vehicles. So. Um, I think there is some truth to that, but on the other side of it, if you talk to the car manufacturers, they would probably tell you that it really depends on consumer demand, right? So what does what yeah. does the marketplace want, and what was what can be sustainable, yeah. and does it meet the the life uh, style of our customers? Yeah. Uh, and I think the good news is we're finding that the cleaner technologies actually can meet the lifestyles yeah. for many different. Uh, consumers, yeah, right? I felt at one point I felt that it was kind of disingenuous when they would say like, "Hey, people don't want to buy these cars," and then you're like, "Yeah, you're like the like I'll take I'll give you the Fiat 500 for example." You're like, "It's <laughs> like twenty thousand dollars more," and you're saying it costs you like you're losing money in it because you're outsourcing all this technology. Like they're not building the batteries, they're not building the motors, right? So they're outsourcing all these parts, and and I knew because I'm on the other side of. Uh, like I'm on the side of, of recycling, right? I'm recycling all these batteries. And mm -hmm. we, we literally had a like warehouse that's full of batteries that there was nothing wrong with them. There was like like one plug that was like not. And there was no techs at the at the factory, at the assembly line. No one knew how to fix these because everything was outsourced. So then oh, wow. as soon as the battery pack was in work, they're like, oh, send it to be recycled. And they would put in a pallet. They would send it to our warehouse. And we're like, oh, no wonder why these guys are losing money. Now, that's true. They were losing money. But they were losing money because they weren't really attempting to make cars. And so, you know, there's certain things that tell me about certain uh, manufacturers. I know that, you know, they also have a different mission. Like, they have a mission to make cars and make them cheap, you know, affordable. Uh, you know, that's, that's their main, you know. And right. so I think it needed to have a, an external source of pressure to be able to and now i think you know i'm, I'm glad to hear that that's going to happen in the you know uh, uh, with you know the commercial space because i think that's right, right that needs to happen too you need to force <laughs> yeah. the hand of these manufacturers so they can produce cleaner trucks yeah we agree we think there needs to be some forcing function as you're mentioning right so some regulatory with some regulatory forcing function some date in the future by which they they have to convert to a cleaner technology, but yeah. let them choose. How, do, how are they going to meet that regulation, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, prescribed. You, thou shalt do fuel cells or, you know, what, yeah. uh, which is one of the, the, the criticisms of the original ZEV regulation. Um, it seems like it was really geared toward fuel cells and it probably wasn't ready for commercialization uh, at that time. Yeah. Um, and and uh, the, the reason the is because that technology... Evolved. Yeah, and th there's the technologies differ, and so not all of them are the same, right? It's not all of them are as compelling. Not all of them us are, you know, financially right. viable or whatever, you know, or, or scalable yeah, exactly. or whatever. Yeah. yeah, and that's and that's the other big issue, as you mentioned, scalability across the global marketplace, right? So all these car companies are global. They're, well, except, well, Tesla is too. Um, yeah. And so they, they have to have markets in all the different countries in the world, and uh, – and a technology that meets, you know, all those different markets. And um, that's why you were mentioning, you know, Toyota and Honda and Hyundai have bet heavily on fuel cells and they've got fueling stations in their home countries where it makes a, a compelling case. Uh, uh, but they need those different, you know, attributes to support that technology in different parts of the country. So California is a prime example of having uh, fuel cell um, infrastructure. 
Germany is another place where they have hydrogen fueling stations. So there's different places where it really enables the technology. And, you know, that, I guess that's the key is to have the technology really take off. You need to have fueling infrastructure. You need to have the fueling go hand in hand with the vehicle. It can't yes. just be chicken or the egg, as they say, right? Yes. Yeah, like we forget we weren't around <laughs> when the cars were first introduced and you know they they cars were useless without roads right so with <laughs> yeah. without you know so you have to this infrastructure of roads everywhere um and the same thing with gasoline stations you know it's like I, I just saw a movie right. the other day where they they didn't have gasoline oh there was like a race across the united states and mm. they had to take all their parts like extra wheels and tires and stuff but then they ran out of like gasoline somewhere in the middle of the country so they had to use like uh they had to use like horse drawn like what is the the, the, <laughs> the service that would like get across the fast you know it was like they had to use that right like i had to into horses had to bring a, a gallon of gasoline so they could <laughs> refuel the car wow. and then keep going yeah so that was a huge problem at the beginning like the infrastructure didn't exist and now we just take it for granted we're like hey the roads yeah, are there the absolutely. gasoline stations are everywhere and because that's a lot of the criticism that electric cars receive is that all these incentives, all these subsidies that they're receiving, right? And then we're, you know, people are going like, hey, you're, right. you're kind of bl blinding yourself to the fact that there's a huge subsidy to, to gasoline cars that happen at the turn of the century. Like, that's we right. all paid for these roads, you know, they, they didn't pay for them. They're not like the car companies, which is something different that Tesla's doing. They're actually putting their own fueling stations right and maybe that's the reason yeah. why they they have such a uh, an advantage in this market space that they have right now well and that's you know that, that, that there's just this whole legacy of of incentives to different fuels that um is is hard to unwind right and, and hard yeah. to identify who's getting what where uh, to make it uh, viable for any different technology so yeah it's hard to create a, a level playing field for sure for these new technologies to take hold. Um, uh, and that's why from, well, at least from our perspective, from, from air quality perspective, we're really looking at what technology gives us the best bang for your buck for cleaner air. Yeah. Um, and then we try to, you know, dig in and say, okay, wh what do we need to help enable that? Is it the fueling infrastructure? Do you need incentives? Is it some kind of tax break? And then we try to, you know, attack it from there. But clearly you got to start with what technology makes the most sense. Yes. So the other criticism about electric cars that I hear is the fact that they're, they, they might have, you know, zero tailpipe uh, emissions, but they have emissions at the, at, at the power plant level, right? right? And so what, yeah, are, the, what are we doing there? How, do, <laughs> how does our state the, grid look like? Yeah, the oh. infamous well-to-wheels discussion, right? So, yes. um well, the good news is uh, California's electric grid is really clean. I mean, one of the cleanest. The, yeah, it's one of the cleanest. The you know is what's known as a renewable portfolio standard. So, how much renewables are on the California grid? I think locally, Edison is is way over thirty three percent in terms of you know wow. renewables on their grid. So, the California grid is super clean. Um, it, you know, we don't have any oil fired. Uh, in basin generation, so it, within the South Coast, it's mostly, if not all, gasoline fired. So it's it's really clean. There's n absolutely no coal. Right, no coal, coal is probably the dirtiest, and yeah. there's no coal generation in California. So whenever folks, you know, that used to be a criticism a while ago. I think people have kind of gotten educated that uh, electric vehicles are, especially in California, are pretty clean, yeah. even if you look back at in the power plant that produce electricity. If you go back east, that's a different story because they've got coal power plants and that's mm -hmm. um, higher NOx emission, higher sulfur, you know. Uh, uh, so there's a bigger concern back east, but here in California, the West Coast, you know, it, it's pretty darn clean. That doesn't play a big role then, the, the you know, electricity generation and the uh, emissions, you know, problem? Like, because there's some for, emission that comes from, from that, yeah, right? No, you're but absolutely right. Not for smog forming emissions, not for NOx, nah, and not for not ozone. For, um, okay. 
for greenhouse gases, because the renewable portfolio standard percentages that I mentioned, it's pretty high in California. So even from a climate change perspective, uh, it's not, um, it's significant, uh, but uh, for NOx emissions and criteria pollutants, it's not, uh, it's not an issue. Uh, but uh, because there's just so many light duty vehicles, yeah. Uh, and if we want to electrify the heavy duty sector, the challenge now is can the grid support it, right? Yeah. Is there enough supply that can the provide- The grid is becoming unstable recently. <laughs> transportation, well, yeah. And then if you start talking about wildfires and PSPS events, the public yeah. uh, safety shut off events where they're shutting down the grid to protect against f yeah. forest fires, what do you do then if you're running a fleet of trucks and all of a sudden, hey, we're shutting your electricity off, right? So that's another concern. Yeah. So well, uh, I think it's the same thing that I I always because see I've I've made a whole career out of suggesting that people need to build batteries. So so for me the the answer is batteries, yeah. right? Like there are batteries that exist. There's a there's a billion of them, you know, in the planet. We're using them for every single thing. We carry one in our pockets. We have three in our backpacks, you know, with all our devices. Uh, some of us have been driving, you know, electric cars that are like literally the biggest batteries that you will ever see, you know. Um, but now I'm like, oh, you got to put a battery in your building, you know. And right. then if you have right. some solar panel panels up in your roof, then you're generating locally. You don't have to depend so much into in the grid, you know. And so the grid becomes uh, uh, distributed in a sense, yeah. right? No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, right? In fact, we're... Uh, we like that idea. Uh, if you can reduce local generation and put in battery storage, solar panels, yeah. uh, I think the challenge becomes, can you do it in large enough uh, volumes and capacity where you can start taking care of these outages that last for longer than a few hours, right? So, yeah, and, and that's where we think um, fuel cells running off of natural gas uh, could provide a solution as well yeah. as in the uh, like in the grid scale, that's what you're talking about. In grid yeah. scale, okay, right. yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, it makes sense. So even with grid scale batteries, there's you know there there may not be enough you know even square footage, acres and acres to put the batteries right. So that um, no, I there's... mean they're pretty. I mean I don't know. It's it's you know we use quite a bit of energy, <laughs> but like I'll give you an example to run my. I, we had a uh, what was it twelve hour. It was like 12 hour uh, uh, schedule shutdown just last week, two weeks ago here in California, Southern California. I don't know if you you, you were part of the, the it didn't seem like a, it was the areas that were affected by winds or something. So right. we're, we're in that area. Yep. So to give you an example, I have a building here, right? And we do, we don't have heavy machinery, but we do have, you know, stuff, you know, that we do. And to run this entire place for 12 hours, it, t it took like a little battery. I mean, it's like, you know, it's not that big, you know? Right. Um, so it's, I think it's possible. I think maybe like, I don't the economics probably don't work around because battery's still quite expensive to do, uh, you know, to do grid scale, you know, right? Just battery everywhere. But I think maybe then the future is going to get there, you know? Yeah. I don't. Yeah. And I, I, I wouldn't disagree. I think there's, there's certainly low, um, low load, uh, type applications, batteries make the most sense. But if you're talking about, you know, seasonal change, because, you know, batteries will leak, right, uh, in terms of energy draw or energy leakage. But if you want to mm. really look at large-scale displacement of energy and overproduction with renewables, uh, one, uh, at least a theoretical way you can do it is using hydrogen as an energy carrier. So overproduce, mm. overproduction of electricity, you run an electrolyzer, Right? So it's a ah. way of converting electricity to hydrogen. Yes. And okay. then you use it hydrogen, either store it and then create electricity when you need it, or you put it into a natural gas pipeline or do something with it. So hydrogen ah. could use be used to create an energy storage medium. I uh, didn't so think those are, about that. Those are the yeah. types of things we're thinking about. Okay. So for those watching, he's talking about overproduction. This is a, a huge problem that it's exists yeah. in the state of California. We have too many solar panels, in fact. <laughs> so what happens is that duck curve happens, right? And so it's the grid, we're overproducing. There's a surplus of solar energy during the sun hours. And, and then 
it's right as the sun is going down, everybody's going home, turning on their ACs, their lights, their TVs and stuff. Right. And now there's a huge peak, you know, or peak in demand. And so the problem is it's, it's twofold. Like, what do you do with the, all that extra excess energy during the day? And so now you're saying you could produce, uh, you could produce yeah. hydrogen. Yes. I didn't think about that. Yeah. And cause that, you can produce hydrogen, and then then later in the later part of the day, you can use that hydrogen to then now fuel the yeah, the yeah, grid. reverse the process and create electricity from the hydrogen. It's it's mm. not super efficient, but if you're going to throw that energy away anyway because you're overproducing it, right? So mm. if you don't have enough batteries to capture it, um, you could produce hydrogen and use it hydrogen for either electrolysis or putting it, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, putting it back into the hydro or the natural gas pipeline, so you create a little bit higher uh, heat content natural gas, which doesn't seem to hurt appliances. So there's there's different things that the researchers are looking at, but um, oh, certainly, okay, uh, th there's there's different things that could be done with this electricity that's being overproduced. Yes, because that's a huge problem. And just to me, again, my idea is like, hey, get a battery, because then you put yep. that in your garage. All that energy that you're overproducing. I was thinking, like, I, I'm telling people in my videos, like, if you just have solar panels, which a lot of people in California have, right? Uh, yeah, and I'm like, you're not, I would tell them, like, you're not part of the solution here. You're part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> because you're taxing the grid during the day, and then you're not doing nothing to relieve the, the pressure that it's feeling in the afternoon, right? Unless you right. have some, some storage system exactly. then you're not really helping the grid i mean you maybe you're helping your 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 you know your pocket because you know you they have this net metering that happens right with, right. The, with the grids and stuff right but i'm like if you're looking to help you know the, the grand scheme of things this you know solar panels alone is not that's not the answer you know you got to put some storage energy there somewhere <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the, and the, but the issue, I think a lot of, well, at least in my case, when I put solar panels on my house, they made sure that you didn't overproduce. They don't want you overproducing significantly. Right. So they, they yeah. sized it to your load. Yeah. I think what you're uh, suggesting is a great idea is if you oversize it, take that mm -hmm. excess capacity, put it into your battery. And now you have this energy storage uh, capacity where you can use that during peak hours. Right. So yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, the problem the problem is that no one's home during the day, right? Like when the sun's out at noon. Well, now we are. <laughs> well, this year's different. This this year yeah. throws that whole <laughs> a wrench right. in the whole thing. But typically, people are at work, you know, and so the, the right. your home is just consuming like a couple hundred watts, you know, the fridge, the clocks, yep. the whatever, the pool <laughs> pump if you have one or so. There's not a, a lot of energy that is consuming that's it's, right it's all when we're going home right and that's exactly that's when the sun's going down we're all going home and and like people don't understand like when when we're at work like we're all in these like office spaces and there's a single like air conditioner because one of the biggest you know energy consumption you know devices or appliances at any building is the the hvac right? i see yeah. and so when you were at work there's one a giant AC unit that is keeping us all cool. There's a hundred people in the building. Is you know I got maybe a couple of units or whatever, but then we all go home and we all flip our own. You know what I mean? Like and now it's yeah. like a hundred AC units that are going on and the lights and the TVs and right. you know in the winter is the the well the heating I think is mostly done in via gas here in <laughs> California. Right. Um, but it's it's really the summers is what's the killer here. And so that's a huge, huge problem. So yeah, I think that's what's happening with the solar industry is that they they just didn't do it right. They were like, ah, let's get solars in here and put grid tie inverters. They just forgot about the batteries, you know? And I, I think yep. things are changing, I think slowly, but I don't think they're changing fast enough. Yeah, I, I, well, you're bringing up a huge problem. That's the problem with uh, renewables is the intermittency, right? It's, it's there's, mm -hmm. You know, we call it diurnal cycle, right? So there's a peak when the sun comes up and you've got a lot of energy and then it goes down yeah. and that's right at the time when everyone's going home. So, that, how do, you know, the, the challenge is how do you level that out? Batteries is a great way to do it. The yeah. other issue is that if you all drive electric cars and you're, you're at work, all those cars are just sitting there parked. Yeah. Right? Is there a way to take advantage of the, that energy that's just sitting there? Vehicle to grid, yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. So there, there's lots of exciting things that can be unlocked with electrification of transportation for sure. Yeah. So we need more mandates when it comes to that because <laughs> – because there's a mandate. Okay, there's a mandate in the state of California that says all new construction in 2021, 2022? I don't know. Starting 2022, I think, all new construction must have solar panels, right? And so and then I, when I was, I'm like, God, no! What do you mean? There's too, bad, there's too much solar already. Get some batteries. Mandate some batteries. <laughs> well, that's funny. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure. Well, I work for the government, so mandates is, uh, is uh, part of our vocabulary, but the, the regulated industry does not want to hear, <laughs> yeah. hear more about mandates for sure. You don't want to have, uh, yeah, there, there, there are other ways to do things besides mandates, but you know, clearly sometimes it's required. It's required. I think industry, the, the, yeah, I, industry doesn't always do the best thing <laughs> for everyone. You're right. Sometimes True. you have to twist their arms, you know, our own arms, because, you know, we're all, you know, we're all in business. We're all doing the thing. It's just sometimes we don't like to see it that way. Yeah. But, you know, being healthy is a thing that it's not, it doesn't seem to have a lot of value for a lot of people. It's not until you're sick. Do you have yeah. asthma? And you can't breathe. Then you're like, oh, maybe we should have done something about this, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I, sh I, I would speak too soon about mandates. There is a clean health mandate, a clean air mandate that we have, right? We've got to do everything in our power to get to healthy air. So you're right. Uh, and it takes the government sometimes to say, this is what's required to get to clean air. Uh, you got to do all these different steps. But I think the key is giving enough time for industry and other stakeholders to react in order to develop things that could be beneficial for them and the economy. So making sure that's not just, you know, one day it's X and the next day it's Y and just throws everything yeah. into a tailspin. So that's, that's, that's the balancing act. Yeah. You got to protect the, the business interests of everyone. You don't want to put people out of business. Although look at this year, this year's so <laughs> different. This is, yes. this came out of nowhere. So, I mean, how much business did we lose in the state? It's got to be crazy. I mean, it's uh, there's been yeah, it, there's mixed there's mixed messages in the economy, right? So surprisingly, you know, when you're on the I don't know back in March, April, uh -huh. you know, when the first stay-at-home orders came down, there was no one on the freeways, right? The traffic was, was post-apocalyptic almost. It was just like, yeah. what is going on here? But now you start set steadily seeing more traffic. Uh, but it turned out the truck traffic only went down by about 20%. So if you look at the imports in the both ports of LA and Long Beach, they're actually, if they're not at record levels, they're pretty close. And so, wow. you know, that could be an indication that everyone's stocking up for the holidays. Uh, it's not clear, but, you know, I know that a lot of people are ordering stuff off of Amazon. They're doing a bunch of online ordering, right? You got to, you still oh, need your goods and services. Let so. me tell you, that was, uh, that was uh, like, that was disruptive. I, I order everything on Amazon and it's Amazon was me this too. thing where you order, you know exactly when it's going to come and it's usually tomorrow or the next day. And all of a sudden, for the first time in modern history, it, it wasn't <laughs> the case. And yeah. we, I was. <laughs> I was yeah, freaking what out. What are you going to do? It's, it's two <laughs> days instead of one day. Oh, my gosh. I'm like, I, what do you mean it's not going to be here tomorrow? <laughs> like, my whole world was uh, upside down. When it, yeah, it's, it's crazy. But I think, yeah, definitely getting the air clean without hurting too much of the economy, too much business, I guess it must be a hard thing to do because everything, yeah, I mean, this is a big animal. This is a big machine that it's. It's taken right. a long time to, to get rolling, right? To get going. And you, so any little thing that you do could have huge impacts in different industries. Yeah, absolutely. In I mean, it, it, you could have pristine air, but no one lives here, right? So <laughs> that's one way. You know, that's, yeah, that's the extreme. So you, you've got to work within the confines of. Uh, of Which, by the way, the did we have record, record days, like clean days, like in March and April? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> most of that was due to weather events because you remember there was super rainy, right? In, oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Rain washes of, down all the nonsense. Yeah, it's like a air. natural scrubbing event. Um, yeah. yeah. And so if, if we and, and our scientists have looked at that and they can tease out a little bit of air quality improvement, but most of it was kind of within expected levels of variation. So even though 
like I mentioned, traffic was super light. Um, heavy duty vehicle traffic wasn't that uh, significant. Ah, so the bigger polluters were still out there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. the big trucks. Well, it's true because we were all eating. We were all ordering Amazon stuff. I yeah. mean, they, we did stop <laughs> living. Right. We're just yeah. not living at home, not at the office, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. I see. I I thought, I remember reading some some stories where, you know, like animals started coming out of the woods into <laughs> cities and the fish started appearing right. in the ponds. Yeah, I or in the I, I remember like having a good feeling like, oh my God, look at this. Nature would jump right in and like heal itself like in a matter of like months you know if we just gave it a chance you know i remember feeling like good about that i'm going like okay this is not all lost like this is not this we have a chance to like do the right thing here you know <laughs> was i all wrong into you know being, <laughs> feeling so optimistic there no yeah no i read that too it was interesting but i boy i I really want to go out to dinner sometime and then have to That's worry true. about wearing a mask, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm actually not a very social person, right? I'm kind of antisocial. I do this. I'm a YouTuber, right? Like, that's I, I speak yeah. to millions of people, but, I, I, you know, when I'm in my room by myself, you know? Um, but even I am, like, going, hey, let's go to a party. Like, I want to see uh, someone else that is just, you know, my immediate family already. Like, yeah, come exactly. on. Right. Yeah, it's, it's cer- yeah, it, it, it certainly is a very unusual year for you know yes. but for air quality purposes it doesn't look like it's going to be that much different than what we've seen historically ah i see so hopefully we can stay on the trend of diminishing yep. the particles per billion of of smog and uh greenhouse uh gases right green right. yeah okay well that's pretty interesting so let's talk about volkswagen what Ugh. what role did you play in that whole thing, or did your department play in that? Were you guys involved in, in that, or not really? Because no, not 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 specifically. The the state air resources board really had a a, a pivotal role in identifying the uh, the scandal, okay. where they they were able to see, I believe it was from um, some on road emissions testing that, um, you no, know, it was probably. Yeah, we lost sound. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah, we lost your audio. Oh, there you go. Is that better? Oh, oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I we, didn't hear yeah. that whole thing. The whole answer. Okay, no, kind of well, good, yeah. it wasn't really that interesting. But <laughs> <laughs> is that we weren't involved, but the state air resources board was involved, and they air identified uh, the the uh, uh, through some engine testing that the engines were not performing at the levels they were supposed to be. So they identified the cheating. You know, there were software defeat devices that were installed. Yeah. Uh, you know, and as you know, if you read the headlines, Volkswagen admitted to it. Um, but because of that, Volkswagen had to pay into this huge consent decree uh, across the nation. California got a large uh, Volkswagen settlement uh, to reduce emissions by providing incentives. And so, in fact, uh, we are administering a couple big programs uh, for Volkswagen as part of the Volkswagen um, uh, program uh, for cleaner trucks, combustion sources, as well as zero emission trucks. So those are two different uh, portions of that VW uh, consent decree. Um, but, you know, they're trying to make up for those defeat devices. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like a uh, punishment, right? And they, they have to, oh, it's absolutely. quite a bit of money, right? Yeah. It's like, it's huge money, like billions of dollars or something. Yeah. yeah. So California got, I can't recall the, to- the total amount, but we're administering 60 million for combustion uh, related cleaner technologies. Oh, okay. And, uh, I can't recall off the top of my head how much it was for zero emission, but the first round of the zero emission was about thirty million. Wow! To, okay. to uh, get cleaner trucks on the road, and they had to spend some money and uh, build an infrastructure, right? The, the that's right. Yep. America thing or something. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's all happening here in California too, right? Oh, absolutely. Or part yeah. of it. Yeah. So they're they're they are charged with charged uh, with putting in <laughs> electric infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. 
but it, yeah, you know, that's good. It's a kind of a weird deal because they were allowed to set up their own business, right? So it's mm, Electrify yeah. America, but wow. yeah, so the, even though they were caught, you know, doing this cheating, yeah, they're going to make they were allowed money. to set up their own business to put in infrastructure and, you know, I guess yeah. hopefully make a profit. I mean, but at least you have some say so on what they're going to do. At least. They they were they got caught several times. Not it was not a single time. It was like they were like, no, yeah, oh yes, we didn't do the thing, and then they're like, we stopped using it, and then they're like, what are you talking about? We just got you again, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. I think there were several rounds involved, of that, yep. and yep. I, got, I think some people went to jail. Maybe I think some XX right or something. Yeah, I can't so recall. They, I, I re, yeah, yeah, I remember reading something about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. having Big some deal. say in where they spend some some money, I think it's a good thing, right? If especially if you're doing these newer technologies and stuff, uh, and yeah. if it's better for the environment, I'm I'm all for it. You know, I'm a huge fan of Volkswagen. You know, like Nazi era, <laughs> but not so much somehow. But not so much the new modern Volkswagen because I'm like, oh come on, those guys are just criminal. You know, <laughs> that's a yeah, weird. Well, weird. <laughs> It's a weird well, thing and, to and have. And they, they've apparently got the religion now, right? So they are going to produce a bunch of different electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're kind of all in now with uh, electrification and zero tailpipe emissions. But, you know. They almost had to, right? I don't think they would have survived yeah. with that, without that. Although they don't have the same thing. Well, we are the biggest car um, market in the world, right? Yeah, Southern California is a huge market, yeah. I don't know if it's the largest, but it but, clearly well, is one the of the Well, the United biggest. States has to be the oh, biggest. Oh, U.S., yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So they kind of had to do it. I'm sure they could sell cars everywhere else in the planet, but this is the biggest car manufacturer in the world, right? And so, yeah. But the I think that what's interesting is what's driving a lot of the manufacturing technologies globally. It's not necessarily uh, the U.S. It's China, India. Yeah, you know, some parts of Europe where there's a, a huge demand. Yeah, um, but clearly in Europe the mandate is for lower greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, that's why fuel economy is a big deal everywhere else. Here in in the states, it's not as big a um, a concern. You know, everybody wants their big SUV or the big trucks, and uh, yeah. which typically don't get the best fuel economy. Yeah, right. So um, we are lagging in terms of that that. Uh, you know, motivation from the consumers. Um, but I think we're catching up. I think a lot of people are now, you know, they're listening to your podcast and they say, hey, hey I want a cleaner technology. I want zero emissions. Can you yeah. make that, you know, battery electric in a truck? Like, right. So the Ford F-150 is going to be electrified. I mean, so there's, there's, uh, I think they're slowly getting more demand for that. Yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah. I mean, we all like, we all want to breathe better. I know that I've, I've I had, so. you know, breathing problems uh allergies but you know it's like i'm sure some of those are due to all the chemicals in the yeah in, in the air you know not just you know natural ones you know who knows what they are i don't even know what they are but i'm like breathing's kind of important <laughs> <laughs> so it's very should, important yeah yes yeah so we so we should breathe good air uh, at least as good as we can have it right and so yeah i we, sh we should do whatever it takes one of the things yes. that kind of gets me is like people who live like by the freeways, oh. right? Like a, next to a highway. And it's like, oh, my God. Like, well, one, they're breathing all that smog, and, you know, and emissions and stuff. But then what about the, the tire, like the rubber particles? Is that like yeah. a big thing also? Yeah, you're bringing up a, a, a huge problem. You know, we, we found that near roadway emission, near roadway emissions is a big um health problem it could you have much higher emissions near freeways as you're mentioning um oh. tire wear brake wear dust it's you know pm 10 pm 2.5 uh, those are issues but uh it's really uh you know, you know the big the bigger problem is diesel particulate because diesel, diesel particulate is a carcinogen wow. and so if you've got trucks that are sitting there idling stop and yeah. go traffic and your house is just over the sound wall that's the black stuff that comes out, right? Oh, yeah. On the tailpipe. It's like yeah, you can literally see it on the, on the diesels. Yeah. 
Yeah, that yeah. stuff is a, a carcinogen. So wow. it, it, you know, it's definitely not good for you. Yeah. Uh, and so those emissions are are significant. And we're also find that there there's these things called ultrafine particles, so very small microscopic particles that uh, are created during the combustion process from vehicles. Uh, and it can get, they're so small, they get into your lungs and into your bloodstream. And we're finding that those ha can have significant health effects. Wow. Uh, and and ha being near the source or near freeways, uh, it actually is, it's it's more, there's a higher concentration of ultrafines uh, near the roadway than further away. So, you know, yeah. just living near the freeway is not great. Don't get that house. It's a well, good those deal. Are land use, yeah. <laughs> those are land use decisions. And those are, you know, that's not something the Air Quality Management District has control over. Those are all city, you know, jurisdictions. Yeah. But if it's cheap, you have a, a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Right, because there's no, like, low income usually because nobody wants yeah. to live there. So people are just dumb. Pe probably people don't think about it. They're just like, oh, you know. But another well, issue is like noise pollution too. Like, that yeah you know that that also affects your health so you know it's not just air it's also and it's not so. just freeways it's you know industry it's the ports yeah. it's railways i mean the you know, there, there were the reasons that were communities built up around these industrial hubs is because those are where the workers lived right yeah mm -hmm. and so it's just it's this historic uh, legacy problem uh, but you're finding out that those are the communities that are most impacted by the pollution yeah uh, and and it's uh one of the ways to mitigate that is by having cleaner technologies yes well i think it's a good thing that what you guys are doing so what is i know that you mentioned some programs where people could uh turn in their leaf blowers please turn in your leaf blowers because <laughs> yes. they're terrible because <laughs> I, I just have a thing i used to shoot at at, at home right my videos you know okay. it's like every week Every day of the week, there's a leaf blower in my neighborhood, and it's like, ah, oh, we can't shoot right now because the the guy over there across the street is leaf blowing the, you know, leaves into our cars, and <laughs> I just don't get what they do, right? But the noise is a it's a real issue, and I guess we, I never thought about it, but it's actually the emissions too. So there's yeah. programs that you said where you people can <laughs> can switch them to. Yeah, we have a couple programs, and so thanks for thanks for pitching that. Is we've got um, one program for residents. So if you want to turn in your older gasoline powered lawnmower, there's a program to get an incentive for that. So you can buy an electric lawnmower. You got to scrap your old one. Uh, ah. And there's also a program for commercial lawn and guard uh, for gardeners. Like if you want to turn in your old, like you're mentioning these gasoline noisy yes. leaf blowers, you can buy a battery operated backpack leaf blower or even a cleaner combustion one or even um you know riding lawnmowers so the big 60 or 46 inch lawnmowers you can do a battery electric version of those and those Look at that. Uh, if you just go to our website which again is www.aqmd.gov so aqmd.gov and then search for you know lawn garden or lawnmowers it'll take you right there but there's also uh, as you know for for uh, clean truck incentives. So if you've got an older truck, uh, on-road truck that's uh, uh, 2009 or older, uh, there's an incentive program where you can get into a cleaner technology too, near zero emission natural gas or zero emission battery electric. Oh, yeah. Oh, I remember that you guys used to have that way back in the day where they would give like older cars <clears throat> that were almost like almost not running. They would give a certain amount for them just to get them off the road kind of thing. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of weird because I'm, I love old cars. Right. Uh, and so we're like, Oh, how many, how many bugs did you guys destroy? How many buses? Yeah. No, <laughs> no, it was usually cars that people didn't want. Uh, right. Although I'm sure you guys did a few number of them. No, <laughs> but that's a good thing. Yeah. Getting some of these older polluting cars off of the road and then getting into newer ones. Yeah, uh, or retrofitting. I don't know. Do you think retrofitting will be a good thing? Because uh, that's what we're light doing. Duty or heavy duty. Well, I mean, I don't know. It's just I, we're doing it kind of like on the on the low end <clears throat> DIY thing, right? I'm right. like, I, I for me it makes sense. Is like, look, I there's already a car in the world, <clears throat> right? And that has a a, a a carbon, you know, footprint, right? Because it was whatever the manufacturing process they used back in the day. So if I fix that old car, 
you know, <laughs> even if you make it gas, now you're still, you know, it's better than buying a brand new one because the brand new one, well, they have to, re or maybe I don't know the, the, the manufacturing price, but you're still using that one that w it's already into the world. You don't have to make another one for you, right? Right. But then if you go further step, which we are doing, and it's kind of like a high-end uh, markets that we're doing, only people with a lot of money because it takes a lot of work. And But we're doing classic cars and we're, we're electrifying them. And so now from there, on the, the for the rest of their life or you know uh now those are zero emission cars no i think that's great right especially if you're taking the the old the older polluting engine mm -hmm. and you're scrapping it or just you know getting rid of it so it's no longer operational then yeah you're you're reducing emissions by a significant amount so yeah more power to you yeah. especially if you're going to a zero emission you know no tailpipe emission technology that's great yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that you do need to worry about, as you mentioned, is kind of the whole life cycle emissions. You know, what, you know, what are those emissions for the batteries that you're using and yeah, any other, the supply chain, you know, as your uh, battery management system and everything that you're doing to retrofit it or repower, something you need to, to think about. But, you know, in concept, what you're suggesting, you're definitely having an emissions benefit. Yeah, because here's the thing. Volkswagen had to recall all those cars. Yeah. And from what I remember, it wasn't a few cars. It was like hundreds of thousands of them, right? Yes. And so right. people were suggesting, like, hey, they're really going to scrap those? What are they going to do with those? And I thought, well, they're probably going to sell them to some other country. Some other poor schmuck is going to you know, be breathing <laughs> that stuff somewhere else. But I'm like, they should probably have some retrofit program where they mm. install that it's it's not it's not the best way to make a, a car into an electric but it is a way that you can right. do it that was the problem yeah. with with the fiat 500 is that the, the, the <laughs> fiat didn't spend anything in like redesigning that car so they essentially just converted their existing car right. and so that's why the batteries kind of fit weird they didn't have long range yep. it wasn't very compelling but it's still better than a regular gas car, or especially yeah. those, because <laughs> those were, because weren't those the emissions so terrible? It was like, it was like tw sixty percent more emissions that, that they should have been allowed, or some crazy oh, from the amount. VW? Yeah, yeah, yes. significant. Yeah, it was huge. And I think they offered they would buy your car back, or they would uh, you had to bring it in. They could do a a, a uh, fix to the computer, but it it hurt your fuel economy. I mean, so the the options were not great, right? Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. If you design it from the ground up, it's much, it's much better, it's much better. which is what they're, which folks are, you know, the manufacturers are doing now. And that makes a lot but more sense. But not if you have a fleet of hundreds of thousands of cars that now have been recalled. Right. <laughs> now, yeah. It, yeah. then it's compelling to be like, you need to have a retrofit. You Don't destroy them because now you destroy them. Now you just, all those carbon emissions that, you know, the footprint that go, went to manufacturing that car right. goes to waste. Right? Yeah. Which is no, another huge true. problem. The, the thing with the batteries, the, you know, they also have a carbon footprint because the manufacturing batteries is not 100% clean. You got to. Right. There's a lot of problems with, you know, building and manufacturing lithium batteries. But uh, the problem or the thing is the compelling reason to do these conversions is that the, these are already here in the States. Like there's all kinds of like e-waste and batteries yes. that are that are waste, right? And they're not uh, useless batteries. We can still take them. Second life. It's a second life, yes. And so if you don't do that, then they're going to end up going into the recycling stream yeah. early. And, and I think that's, that's a big terrible. concern by a lot of people is what do you do with, you know, we don't want to create another problem like we had with lead acid battery recycling where the lead is a, you know, it's carcinogen. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's not healthy at any concentration. And so we don't yeah. want to, you know, create another problem with recycling of lithium, lithium ion. We don't think it's the same problem, uh, but clearly don't want to, you know, go down that road without having a solution. So secondary battery life is a, is a, is one part of the equation. Yeah. Uh, recycling is another part. Uh, and, and is there a way to use, you know, just do it in a smarter way. Can you, you know, lease the vehicle, uh, and so you take the battery out and use it for something else, and that cuts down the original cost of the vehicle. So there's some different business models that could come into play. But you're you're right; it's a uh, it, it's a it's a challenge, but it shouldn't be insurmountable. Yeah, definitely. There are ways to do it. I, I think yeah. 
we're all doing a little part. At least I feel like I'm doing a little bit of part. My dream, you know what my dream is? Uh, speaking of air quality, I recently went, and I know my listeners are going to just think I'm a, like a broken record here because I almost seem to tell every one of my guests. <laughs> but my dream is to electrify a whole fleet of these buses, and huh. I want to take them to Hawaii because I don't know if you visited the islands, but when you go there, the it's time, just yeah. pristine environment, right? I mean, you're just like, oh, my God, it's paradise. And it's just full of cars that it's just, you know, spewing smog everywhere. So pretty soon it's uh, it's going to look like here, right, if we don't do something about it. So my dream is to get this fleet and take it over there and then rent those vehicles to, to people so that they can use zero emission uh, yeah. cars. Yeah, Jay, sign me up, man. I'm 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 there with you. <laughs> Taking uh, electric vehicles to the islands would be just fabulous. There, you know, the, the yeah, because they import all their gasoline, right? So it's very expensive yeah. there, right? So if there's a way to run off either wave energy or solar energy, that makes all the sense yeah. in the world. They're looking they at the hydrogen fuel world. cells as one, uh, you know, one solution. But yeah, sign yeah. me up. Let's go. Let's do it. That's the plan. <laughs> That's why I have this place here. And uh, that's what we're doing. You know, we're just trying to get some of this stuff going. And that's the dream anyways, right? So I kind of do it. I mean, I'm doing it for all the reasons. You know, I do care about, you know, the environment and the air in particular there because I do suffer from some effects of uh, probably, yeah, just living in Southern California. And I think uh, whatever we can do to make that better, well, it's, it's, it's good in my book anyway. So I think you're doing a good job. Um, I hopefully that. listeners will go and trade in their smoggy <laughs> equipment, uh, your cars, there's incentive for, for electric cars too, right? Like, um, uh, there, well, through the state there is, it's called the clean vehicle rebate project, CVRP. So you buy an electric vehicle or a fuel cell vehicle, or even a plug-in hybrid, you get a, you get an incentive. There is a, you know, a small buy down. Um, and, and so we'd, uh, encourage them to look at that program. Yeah. There's a lot of other ones you can ride on some, you know, diamond lanes, you know, the like carpool lanes, yeah, all that stuff. HOV access. All that stuff. So if you're thinking about again, of course, my viewers are they're, they're doing that because they're, they're, you know, I'm always talking about that. I'm like, almost like preachy. Well, hey, listen, I want to thank you for coming and talking to me about this stuff. This is interesting, uh, and I'm sure my audience is gonna find it equally interesting as I do. So, yeah, oh, thank, thank you. For all you. The work yeah, keep you up the good work. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, do you have a website or a social thing that you want to share with our viewers that maybe they can go and, and see more information about what they can yeah, do? Yeah, I would just encourage them to check out our our website. It's www.aqmd, so it's AQMD. Air Quality Management District, .gov. And as I mentioned, there's, there's tons of information there about incentives, about trading in your old dirty lawnmowers, getting electric versions of leaf blowers, cleaner, um, you know, trucks. Uh, there's also information about air quality. So you can download our app, right? And oh, yeah. you can be warned if the air quality is poor in your region. So uh, a lot inside. of good information on our website. Well, wear that mask. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you can do, but you, yeah, you at the very least, with step one, you should know what it is, <laughs> right? So that's good. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining me. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll have you again in the future for another conversation. All right. I'd love to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.